Welcome to The Secret Place with Stefa Bene, devotions for hungry hearts and searching souls. Hi there, friends. This is Stefa in The Secret Place. I'm here with you, still in the midst of our 2020 coronavirus uh, global uh, apocalypse. And I just want to say, uh, with Julian of Norwich, all will be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. All is well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. That is from a lady named Julian of Norwich. If you haven't read her, my goodness, now would be the time to do it. Um, I want to talk to you today um, about a couple of things I um, hope that you're doing well and that you, I'm hoping that by the time I air this in a couple of weeks, that um, this emergency time in our uh, globe will be over and that virus will be uh, put to rest and, and it will be flattened and we will go back to our lives uh, a little bit sharper and better and more patient and more appreciative of the good things that we have. But if it's still going on, we're with each other in this, aren't we? I'm with you. Um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about a book that I've been reading. I'm almost done with. I mentioned it once before. It's called On the Road with St. Augustine by James K.A. Smith. Um, one of the reasons I like this book uh, is because I love St. Augustine and his confessions and the truth uh, that comes out of that. And the other reason why I like this book is because I'm an academic and I love the way um, Smith brings in the great tradition of the church fathers like Augustine into our contemporary thinking. You know, I've always wondered why um, we have like some people who believe in God who are just just satisfied with, okay, we've got scripture. That's our final authority. We've got scripture. Everything is scripture. And then some go, mm, I don't know about that. We've got the great tradition. We've got the church fathers. We've got um, um, the saints and sacraments. Uh, it, like, isn't it great that we have both? Why wouldn't we use both? Why wouldn't we draw uh, encouragement and strength from the great tradition of the church fathers and the way people who went before us who loved the Lord um, worshipped and the, the knowledge and the truth that they found in walking with God through Christ and in Scripture? Why wouldn't we use scripture, uh, the canonized scripture to grow and feast upon? Why wouldn't we do that? Why can't, I can never understand why we can't do both. If someone understands why we only should use one uh, measure of uh, a source of, of spiritual food, please tell me. But anyway, James K. A. Smith talks about learning and how we grow in grace and grow in God through an Augustinian perspective. And I have one little passage to read to you from him. Um, it is here, and he says, uh, For Augustine, the reason I want to know is an indicator of the sort of love that motivates my learning. Am I learning in order to grow? Learning in order to know who and how to love? Or am I learning in order to wield power, to get noticed, to be seen as smart, to be in the know? The disordered love of learning makes you a mere technician of information for some other end than wisdom. And the irony is that philosophy could devolve into just another way of idolizing. Indeed, Augustine could still see in him, this in himself by the time he was a teacher, when he said, I was seeking to use my education to please other people, not to teach them, but just to please them. Oh man, you gotta love this this brothers, this, this, this saint's uh, honesty there. Right, where he actually admits this is Augustine now, right? But he actually admits that he was using his education to kind of like uh, puff himself up or make sure um, that uh, people saw him and were pleased by him, uh, and and using his education to please other people. Um, I love that because I think it needs to be said more. I'm in such, and those of you who know me know that I'm I've been in such an like a really unusual situation my whole life long is that I've only been in academe for 20 years and look how old I am. Can you guess? 
<laughs> I've only been in academia for 20 years. The first 20 years, basically before that, I did. I was ensconced in church work and baby work, children work, raising kids and writing uh, for magazines and being in a band with my husband. Radiance, the band for your celebration, right? I was doing all these things like done with academe. I had my undergraduate degree, got done at 21, and I don't want to see any more textbooks forever. Why did I need them? But then, and this is not the time for that story, I got into academe, I got my master's, I got my PhD, and now I've been like deeply in it for about 20 years. So I don't identify, I don't, my identity is not wrapped up in the fact that I'm a PhD, that I'm a professor. It's like, yes, I am. It serves a purpose. I love it. I love that God led me this way. But it's got its proper order in my life. Well, there's things that don't have the greatest order in my life where we could talk about, you know, other times. But the, the, um, the education and the uh, academic side of me, it's, it's, I think it's balanced. I think it's balanced because I don't want you to like me because I have a PhD. That's something I, that's like my body of knowledge that I, I, um, you know, I garnered through years of study and, you know, and research. And I'm, I'm, hey, if you say, hey, I'm proud of you for that, Stefa, great. I'm so glad that you're proud of me for that. But that's not the core of who I am, right? That's not my identity. And for Augustine, he was saying, well, that's what my upbringing was from birth. That was his identity. That's how he saw himself. That's who he was. He would walk around the marketplace and people knew him and said, hey, there's Augustine. You know, um, people never did that with me. That, they still don't. That's not me. Um, but he is really pointing us to the fact that knowledge can, and, and, and the academy, knowledge, learning itself can be disordered or well-ordered. And in the same way with love, love can be disordered, it can be real love, like, or it can, it can be disordered or well-ordered. And a well-ordered love is a love that springs forth from connection with the author of love himself, God, and flows onto others in a way that is for their good, right? A, a, a disordered love, a love that is not ordered well or ordered right is a love that clutches and wants for itself. Yes, the feelings might be there. There can be love for someone, uh, but it's not well ordered when it's all about you or if it's all about me. And so this is what James K.A. Smith is talking about in this little passage with Augustine where he talks about learning. And um, this is and, and this is the line I was going to say about love before um, that I'll repeat. The disordered love of learning makes you a mere technician of information. Would you want to be just a technician of information? Not me. Okay. The disordered love of learning makes you a mere technician of information. Um, that is that bristles. I I bristle with that idea because. We have been made wonderfully and fearfully made with, with minds that can conceive of such things. Your brain is so complicatedly beautiful or beautifully complicated. However, um, you know that you can keep learning and growing. You can, you can choose to create new neural networks in your brain. Did you know that? Start studying neuroplasticity, and I've talked about it before on The Secret Place, but realize that you and I, were not stuck in, well, I'm 35, or I'm 65, or I'm 25, or I'm 45, and this is all I know. This is what I know. Uh, what can I expect of myself? This is all I know. Oh, no, that is such a de defeated idea, a defeated posture. We can, uh, this is how God transforms us, I believe, by his spirit. He transforms us by the renewal of our mind, our mind, by getting his word and his life and his love and his breath to be things that we're thinking about, by getting the fruit of the spirit, by thinking about others and what we can do for them and how we might encourage and help them. The Bible calls it edify. How we can do that. As these thoughts and this communion with God, this prayer, this talking to him, as this becomes 
normal, everyday behavior in your mind and in my mind. Our minds are being renewed day by day. And as our minds are being renewed, our faith is being strengthened, and we are being transformed. Do you believe the Bible? It says it right there in Romans 12. We are being transformed by the renewal of our mind. I wonder if I should read it to you. Go to Romans 12 and read it. Read the whole chapter and meditate on it. Take some time during this quiet, uh, the quietness of being within our walls and prayerfully think about um, love being well-ordered or disordered. Think about what it means to be a part of the community of faith where when we're, um, we're kind of limited and restrained to being within our own walls of our house, how can we love others? How can we reach out? How can we, if, if the only thing that you can do is pray, if you're 90 years old listening to this and all you can do is pray, do it. Go for it. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I'm here for you. Write me, leave a comment. I'm so glad you tuned in. Um, and I'll be back and I'll, I'll record more and we'll share more. Until then, have a great, great day. Bye now. Breathe, listen, and receive. Take a moment to soak it all in. Until next time.